Labour's mayor has put up taxes by 70 per cent, Mr Speaker, and this is just a glimpse of what they'd do if they got in power. A few weeks ago, he finally admitted it to The Sun. What would he say he would do? I quote, he said, we would put up taxes. It's always the same, Mr Speaker, higher taxes and working people paying the price. No single politician has ever put tax up more times than he has. But, but, but Mr Speaker, uh, just hang on, because he was given the chance... He was, no, he was just given the chance to rule out yeah. cutting the NHS or state pun- pensions to pay for scrapping this... Resor- no, he's... Uh, I was a, l- a lawyer long enough to know when someone's avoiding the question. So I- I'm going to give him another chance. Will he now rule out cuts the NHS, cuts the state pension, or putting up taxes to pay for his unfunded £46 billion promise to scrap national insurance? Which is it? Mr Speaker, I make absolutely no apology about wanting to end the unfairness of the double taxation on work, Mr Speaker. The NHS is receiving record funding under this Conservative government. Pensioners have just received a £900 increase under this government. But if he wants to talk about tax, let's have a look at what Labour's brand newly appointed tax adviser has to say. This adviser this advisor thinks that supporting pensioners is a complete disgrace, Mr Speaker. He believes their free TV licences are ridiculous. And if it wasn't bad enough, this adviser has called for increases in income tax, in national insurance and VAT. Now, it all makes sense now. That's who the Shadow Chancellor has been copying and pasting from. So, so, so this is genuinely extraordinary. Two chances, two chances to rule out, Mr Speaker, two chances to rule out cuts to state pension, cuts to the NHS, or income tax rises to fund his promise to abolish national insurance. Order, order, order. Mr Hall, I want you to set a good example, not a bad one. Keir Starmer. Mr Speaker, this really matters. He's had two chances to rule out these cuts. Cuts to NHS, cuts to uh, tax or, or pensions or tax rises. This matters to millions of people watching who want to know what's going to happen to the NHS and pensions. Uh, it really does matter to millions of people who are watching. So I'll be really generous now and give him one last chance. Very simple, very clear. Is his £46 billion promise to abolish national insurance being paid for by cuts to the NHS, cuts to the state pension, or yet another Tory tax rise? M- Mr Speaker, he's really got to keep up, Mr Speaker. Right? It's, it's, this, it's this government that's just delivered a £900 increase to the state pension. It's this government that's already committed to the triple lock for the next parliament. Uh, he, he had six opportunities. I didn't think I heard him say that, Mr Speaker. And when it comes to the NHS, you'd much rather be treated in Conservative-run NHS in England, not the Labour-run NHS in Wales, Mr Speaker. But it's another week where all we heard is political sniping, Mr Speaker, not a word about their plans for the country. He's failed to acknowledge that since we last met, taxes have been cut by £900, state pensions have gone up, free childcare has been expanded, wages have risen for nine months in a row, Mr Speaker, and just today, inflation down again to 3.2%. Our plan is working and the Conservatives are delivering a brighter future for Britain. Mr Speaker, Mr Speaker, you will not be surprised to learn that I very much welcome the £20 million allocated to Colton in my Gedlin constituency yeah. as part of the long-term plan for tight towns. But I am very eager to see that this money is spent according to local wishes. I know there will be consultations following the setting up of the Towns Board, so will my right honourable friend join me in urging Colton residents to take part in those forthcoming consultations, to make sure their voices are heard and to ensure that this money is spent where the people want? Yeah. 
Can I thank my honourable friend for his tireless campaigning on behalf of the residents of Carlton? Our long term plan for towns means that 75 towns across the country, including Carlton, will benefit from £20 million each to invest in their local area. But crucially, as he said, that will be in the hands of local people deciding on their priorities for the place that we live, whether it's regenerating local high streets, investing in parks and green spaces, or tackling anti social behaviour. We're levelling up across the country, and he deserves enormous praise for his role in securing that investment. SNP leader Stephen Flint. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This week, a former Prime Minister who oversaw a financial crash before being unceremoniously turfed from office told the public the truth, and I'm not referring to that one, Mr. Speaker, <laughs> because on Monday, Gordon Brown told the people of these aisles that the forces pulling Britain apart are greater than the forces holding it together. So maybe the Prime Minister can find some time this afternoon to perhaps agree with just one of his predecessors. Well, Mr Speaker, where I do agree with my predecessor very strongly is that Scotland would be far stronger inside the United Kingdom. Mr Speaker, of course, where Gordon Brown was also correct was in stating that Scottish independence is not simply off the agenda. And indeed, those remarks were echoed just yesterday by the General Secretary of the Scottish Trade Union Congress, who stated that it remains an unresolved issue, Mr Speaker, before going on to state, and I confirm, and they may laugh at her, but she said, that can be a very dangerous place to end up in when you are not allowing people to express their wishes in a democratic <laughs> manner. So may I ask... So may I ask the... So may I ask the Prime Minister, does he welcome the fulsome, wholehearted and warm support of the Labour Party in denying the people of Scotland that opportunity to have a say over their own future? Well, Mr Speaker, we did have a democratic vote on that topic, uh, but what I would suggest to the SNP is that rather than obsessing about independence and indeed wasting time cracking down on free speech and trying to lock up J.K. Rowling, he should focus on what the people of Scotland actually care about – schools, hospitals, jobs and our new tax cuts. Name Andrea Jenkins. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I abhor a two-tier policing system, and we must ensure that everyone is treated equally under the rule of law. The Labour Police and Crime Commissioner who investigated the Beagate scandal handed their police chief constable a new three-year contract whilst the investigation into the Labour Party leader and deputy leader was ongoing. Now, two former Labour MPs are overseeing the force due to investigate the opposition deputy leader. Does the Prime Minister agree with me that complete transparency throughout this investigation is of the utmost importance? Yeah. My uh, right honourable friend makes an important point. A key principle of our country is that there are the same rules for everyone. And when it comes to this topic, I do think the Labour leader should show some leadership to avoid stop reading the legal advice, simply just publish it and get a grip of the situation. And it says a lot about his priorities, that when it comes to his famed legal expertise, he's more than happy to help defend his Victoria, but refuses to help his own deputy leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The recently published Canova report makes it absolutely clear that the IRA was riddled with British agents uh, from top to bottom. Those agents were involved in abduction, torture, and murder of British and Irish citizens. The British government, successive British governments, knew all about it and did nothing. The report also calls for an apology from the government to those victims. Will the, will the Prime Minister take this opportunity now to make that apology? Well, Mr Speaker, as the Honourable Gentleman will know, this is an interim report, as the Secretary of State has laid out. We can't comment on the findings until we get the final report, but we would never condone wrongdoing where there is evidence of this. But I will say this also because it's not said enough. The overwhelming majority 
of the police, armed forces and intelligence services served with great distinction. They defended democracy in the face of some horrendous violence, and without their service and their sacrifice, there would have been no peace process. They helped ensure that the future of Northern Ireland will never be decided by violence, but by the consent of its people. So, Simon Plot, does my uh, right honourable friend agree with me? Uh, We don't agree on everything, but we do do agree on this, that if anyone wants to see why this government has introduced strong mayors, they need only look to Ben Houchen in the Tees Valley. To introducing our free port, to bringing steel making back, Ben delivers. And does my right honourable friend agree with me that the best thing that Ben has done is do this without charging any mayoral tax, which his Labour opponent would need to do to fund his unfunded spending plans? Well, my right honourable friend is absolutely right to raise the great work of Ben Houchen, and I share his concerns about the pledges of the Labour candidate. Over £130 million of unfunded spending, showing that Labour can't be trusted. And we all see the results of this, Mr Speaker, in Labour-run Birmingham. Taxes going up by 20 per cent. And that is the story of what Labour in local government means. Working people paying the price, and it's exactly why he and I completely agree on this, that people of Teesside should vote Ben Houchen and vote Conservative. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Last year in Shropshire, 10,000 people waited for more than 24 hours in A&E. That's 10,000 people over 65 waiting on hard plastic chairs or in trolleys in our accident and emergency department. The Prime Minister tells us he's got a plan for the NHS, but what people in North Shropshire want to know is how long they are going to have to wait for him to get on and fix the issues where we are. Well, Mr Speaker, with the record funding that we're putting into the NHS, our urgent emergency care plan is delivering more ambulances, more beds, but also faster discharge through our hospitals to speed the flow. And that plan is working. Of course, there's more to do. But this winter, we saw ambulance and A&E waiting times improve from the year before uh, for the first time in many years. And if we stick to the plan, we'll continue to deliver improvement for her constituents and everyone else. Gareth Johnson. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, in 2010, somebody earning £15,000 a year paid £1,700 in income tax. Today, somebody earning £15,000 a year pays less than £500 of tax. So does the Prime Minister agree with me that this has helped create jobs, growth and self-reliance? My honourable friend is quite right, and because of our plan, the economy, after a tough few years, has indeed turned the corner. Inflation has fallen from over 11 per cent to 3.2 per cent. It's forecast a return back to target in just a few months, a year ahead of expectations. And that's why, Mr Speaker, we've been able to cut people's taxes, a tax cut, as he mentioned, worth £900 for an average worker, which, by the way, is part of our plan to end the long-term unfairness of the double taxation on work. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Four years ago, my constituent Juliana was drugged and raped by her then-boyfriend. After his conviction, Juliana was advised that reading a transcript of his trial would help her to come to terms with her experience. But when she requested that transcript, she was told that she would have to pay more than £7,000. Astonishingly, Juliana is not alone. I have heard about victims who have been quoted fees of up to £22,000 just to read trial transcripts that are part of their own story. Mr Speaker, justice should not have a price tag. The Liberal Democrats' amendment to the Victims' Bill would give all victims the right to read sentencing remarks and summings up free of charge. Mm -hmm. Juliana is here in the gallery today and she asks if the Prime Minister will support that amendment. Will he look her in the eye and say yes? Mr Speaker, I'm extremely sorry to hear about Juliana's case and my sympathies with her and indeed her family. We are committed to improving victims' access to court transcripts to help them move on and rebuild their lives. We already offer a free service to families of homicide victims, uh, for example, and that is why we have already committed to a one-year pilot to help identify the current demand, inform our next steps, and alongside this we are actively looking at other options to immediately reduce the costs. Jim Sunderland. Mr Speaker, Bracknell Forest Council has a particular challenge with special educational needs and I am keen to support them. I am grateful to the Government for the recent SEN review 
the significant increase in resources and the bespoke safety valve programme for Bracknell, but additional school places are needed now. Could the Prime Minister please agree today to release the funding for our new SEN units at Sandhurst and Edgebarrow schools and commit to fully funding up front our new SEN school in Crowthorne? Yeah, yeah. Uh, can I thank my honourable friend for highlighting how Bracknell Forest's local authority has worked positively with the department through the safety valve programme. And as part of that agreement, over the next few years, the council will receive £16 million in extra funding to provide the vital education that my honourable friend's constituents deserve. Uh, I'm told that the department is still reviewing capital bids for the safety valve programme, but they will be in touch with local authorities directly as soon as possible. Daniel Zack. In the exchanges earlier, we didn't hear much of a defence from the Prime Minister of his predecessor, so perhaps he could tell the House, what does he consider to be her greatest achievement? <laughs> well, this, Mr Speaker, what I want... Uh, Mr Speaker, while the party opposite were busy trying to take us back into the EU and reverse the referendum result, my predecessor was signing trade deals around the world, which have now meant, which have now meant Mr Speaker, that Brexit Britain has overtaken the Netherlands, France and Japan to become the fourth largest exporter in the world. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My constituent, Claire Massey, and one of her two children almost lost their lives in a fire at her home in February 2023. Since then, Claire has been a victim of bullying by aggressive claims handlers and negligent and unprofessional conduct, including violating a policy and withdrawing alternative accommodation by the insurer, policy expert, part of the accredited Insurance Europe Group and Limited uh, Trinity Claims Management. Claire has raised institutional failings with the Financial Conduct Authority, which appears toothless. She's also successfully raised individual issues with the Financial Ombudsman, but the delaying tactics of the insurance means she's no closer to a resolution. Claire is here in the gallery today and is asking, will the Prime Minister meet with her and me to look at how we can better protect consumers against bad practices in the insurance industry? And does he agree with me that it is time to establish an office of the whistleblower? Yeah, yeah. My uh, honourable friend is an excellent campaigner on behalf of her <laughs> constituent, and can I extend my sympathies to Claire? and her family. Uh, whilst it, I can't comment on individual cases, I'm sure she'll understand, I know that the Financial Conduct Authority does have the powers that it needs to take action against firms that breach its rules, and further customers can contact the Financial Ombudsman Service, whose decisions are binding on insurers. But I will immediately ensure that the relevant minister meets with my honourable friend to look more closely at the specific issue and the case that she raises. Hey. Ukrainian Member of Parliament uh, Mikola Stefanchuk is in the public gallery this afternoon. I'm sure we all wish to welcome him and wish uh, Ukraine, Slavy Ukraine. Hey. Mikola has told me that Ukraine has the people, Ukraine has the courage, but U Ukraine does not currently have the weapons and the air defence to secure her freedom. In light of today's Russian attack on Chernihiv this morning, which has killed at least 10 and injured many more, can I ask the Prime Minister, will he respond to President Zelensky's statement that this would not have happened if Ukraine had, had received su sufficient uh, defence, uh, air defence equipment? Yeah. 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 Uh, well, uh, Mr. Mr Speaker, it was a pleasure to address members of the Ukrainian Parliament when I visited Ukraine earlier this year. Indeed, it was my first foreign visit of the year. I was the first foreign leader to visit Ukraine and President Zelensky to demonstrate our strong support for the Ukrainian people at their moment of struggle against Russian aggression. Uh, we have increased the amount of support that we have given to Ukraine this year, indeed the first major country to do so, uh, and a big part of that support concerns air defence, where we have led in supporting Ukraine's efforts. We will continue to do so and also continue to encourage other countries around the world to step up and match our leadership, because we all want to see a future for Ukraine based on freedom from tyranny. Nikki Aitken. Mr Speaker, on a recent visit to Pimlico in my constituency, the Prime Minister heard directly from local people concerned about the eye-watering rise in violent crime and robberies. Does my right honourable friend agree with me that the London Labour Mayor has failed to take yeah, advantage yeah. of extra government funding to recruit more police and that on the 2nd of May, Londoners can send him a very clear message he's let them down? Yeah. Mr Speaker, Sadiq Khan is failing London. While burglary is down across England, it's up in London. 
Violent crime down across England, but up in London. And the Labour Mayor is the only one of 43 police and crime commissioners to have missed his police recruitment target. <laughs> Londoners will have a chance, Mr. Speaker, to cast their vote on the 2nd of May, and I hope that they kick him out because we all know they'll be safer with Susan Hall. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My local community is reeling from the discovery of 35 bodies and unidentifiable cremated ashes at a local funeral home. Their pain has been made worse when they realised the funeral plans they'd used their life savings for were fake. Does the Prime Minister agree that in these unique and limited circumstances, banks should offer discretion when deciding if chargeback applies to payment refunds? Oh, can I express my sympathies to the families affected by the case that the Honourable Lady raises? Uh, I believe that Ministry of Justice are urgently looking at the matter that she's raised and I'll ensure that someone gets in touch with her as soon as possible. Derek Thomas. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. Robotic surgery allows laparoscopic surgery to be performed with increased precision, flexibility and control. This can result in reduced patient complication rates, reduced length of stay in hospital and reduced hospital readmissions. However, there is currently no robotic surgery provision in Cornwall. As a result, residents of Cornwall have to travel to Devon for robotic procedures, a journey of more than 80 miles, 120 miles if you're from Isle City, for West Cornwall and Isle City residents. Will my friend the PM, the Prime Minister, commit to ring fence capital funding for Cornwall to establish a robotic surgery service and address the health inequalities our constituents have lived with for far too long? Yeah. Uh, can I thank my honourable friend for highlighting the potential of this innovative technology uh, for patient care. I'm delighted to see that more generally Cornwall is benefiting from our new hospital programme, providing a new women's and children's hospital in the centre of Royal Cornwall, uh, which he and I discussed when I was last with him. Uh, but I can also tell him that NHS England are actively exploring opportunities to expand robotic assisted surgery. Any uh, decisions on funding new allocations will factor in health inequalities, such as areas with less access to robots today, and I will ensure that the current access to robotic surgery in my honourable friend's local community is appropriately considered by the relevant health minister. George Galloway. Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister told us on Monday that he was off to make a telephone call to Mr Netanyahu to urge restraint on a government that has killed and maimed well over 100,000 people in six months. 72% of them women and children. Can you tell us how the telephone call went and what he will do if his advice is not taken and an unrestrained war begins? Mr Speaker, I was pleased to speak with Prime Minister Netanyahu, who thanked the UK for their support of Israel's security over the weekend. We also discussed the situation and how Iran is isolated on the world stage, uh, and also I made the point to him that significant escalation is not in anyone's interest, and it's a time for calm heads to prevail. I also reiterated our concerns about the humanitarian situation in Gaza, where I welcome the statements and commitments that the Israeli government have made about significantly increasing aid into Gaza, and now we need to see those commitments delivered. Nigel Bills. Thank you. The residents in Smalley and Denby are now faced by two huge solar farm applications with only a 500 metre gap between them. And the, uh, both sites are wholly in the green belt. So would the Prime Minister agree we should change planning guidance to make it absolutely clear that productive farms in the green belt are not the right place for solar farms and the investment and the time being spent should go on sites that might be appropriate like car parks or brownfield land or rooms of industrial buildings rather than wasting people's time and causing fear like this? Well, Mr Speaker, my honourable friend is right that particularly at a time of increased geopolitical risk, we must protect our nation's food security and therefore our most valuable agricultural land. We do want to see more solar, which is one of the cheapest forms of energy, but, as he said, on brownfield sites, rooftops and away from our best agricultural land. And that's why our recently published national infrastructure planning rules set out the requirement for solar not to be placed on what is described as best and most valuable versatile land where possible. Uh, the Energy and Environment Secretaries are ensuring that developers and planning authorities strike the right balance so that we can deliver what he wants, which is more British food grown here, here at home. That's from McKinnell. Yeah. 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 
up recently with Chris McEwen, the mayoral candidate in Teesside, yeah. it was clear that residents are really worried about crime. Yeah. Levels in Tory-run Teesside are some of the highest in the country. Yeah. Residential burglary rate is 52% higher than anywhere else in the country. When will the Prime Minister realise that he's not only lost control of his party, but of crime in this country too? Yes. Yes. I mean, Mr Speaker, Mr Speaker, what a joke, right? But we've got 50, we've got Police and Crime Commissioner elections across the country, and the Honourable Lady really should look at the record. Under this government, crime has been cut by 50 per cent. 20,000 more police officers. But here are the facts, and this is why it's so extraordinary to hear what she said. People with a Labour Police and Crime Commissioner are more likely to be victims of burglary and twice as likely to be victims of robbery. The facts completely speak for themselves. Vote Conservatives for safer streets. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Every month, my constituents see the Labour on Warrington Council spend nearly £4.5 million on interest payments to cover their £1.8 billion debt. Our borrowing they've used to spend on an energy company that went bust, offices in Birmingham and Manchester, and even a business park that they purchased through an offshore company, presumably to avoid paying tax. It's time to send in the inspectors. Yeah, Warrington yeah. Council has gone too far in its money-making schemes, yeah, yeah. and local councils should focus on delivering great services. And the way to achieve that is vote Conservative on the second. Well, Mr Speaker, this year the Government announced a further £600 million in extra funding for local councils, a real terms increase as it has done every single year of this Parliament. But we all know what happens when Labour are in charge, whether it is racking up debt in Warrington, as my honourable friend said, the 21 per cent council tax increase in Labour run Birmingham, or indeed slashing services in Nottingham, or as I just said, higher crime on average in each Labour Police and Crime Commissioner area. It's crystal clear, Mr Speaker, that whenever Labour in charge, it's working people that pay the price. Mr Speaker, while 64,000 people are on the waiting list for a council house in the West Midlands, families are living in hotels, in cold and damp homes and mouldy flats. The Mayor of the West Midlands, Andy Street, has built 46 social homes in eight years. Does the Prime Minister think that is good enough? Mr Mr. Speaker, Andy Street is absolutely delivering for the West Midlands. He, unlike the Labour Mayor in London, he's delivered on all his housing targets, in fact. But he's, it's the Labour run council in Birmingham that's imposing on her constituents and others a 21% council tax rise. And what are they getting in exchange for that? 600 job losses, cuts to services, and on some streets, they're even turning off the lights, Mr. Speaker. I tell you, what, the Labour, what Labour have done to Birmingham, the Conservatives will never let them do to Britain. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, um, can I just ask the Prime Minister to thank his right honourable friend, the Secretary of State for Transport, for further meetings with Hitachi this morning, indeed with the union representatives. We're all glad to see what's happened with Alstom yesterday, yeah, yeah, yeah. but it's important that we do the same to support the factories up at Hitachi in Aircliffe. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, Mr. Speaker, can I thank my honourable friend for his role uh, in championing the rail industry in the UK? As uh, as he rightly said, the Department for Transport and the Secretary of State have been actively engaged with companies to ensure we have a robust supply chain. And as he knows, we're investing record amounts in rail investment, particularly uh, in the north. And we're pleased to see that that's being delivered. Question, Nasha. Speaker. The Prime Minister is no doubt aware of the collapse of SSV law and many constituents, including hundreds in my constituency, have been affected and have bills of hundreds, up to hundreds of thousands. One constituent had to sell his, new, his uh, wedding gifts and his father had a heart attack with the stress. People are having to pay, literally raid their pension pots and getting bills and barely knocking on the door. Will the Prime Minister we, meet with me and my constituents' representatives of the collapse of SSB law and make sure the government responds to something that is an injustice? that's happened to people across the country. Uh, well, Mr Speaker, I'm sorry to hear about the situation impacting the Honourable Lady's constituents. I'll be more than happy to make sure the right minister looks into it and we get back to her as soon as possible. That completes Prime Minister's questions. 
questions by MPs the first time in a month in the House of Commons. We're still joined here in the studio by Health Minister Maria Caulfield and Shadow Health Minister Andrew Gwynne. You've been sending in your questions, telling us who you are, mostly. Uh, <laughs> where are you from? Mm. Could do better for next week. Um, just to remind you of that uh, email, gbnews.com slash your say. Our panel are ready and waiting because this programme is different from the others. Not about our questions, is it? Oh. It's all about yours. And the first question from, from Jean, but Jean, do tell us uh, where you are. Um, to you, Amir Caulfield, your health minister, Jean asks, although smoking is a serious subject, why on earth is your leader, Rishi Sunak, giving so much time to this when the whole world's falling apart? Well, it is important because, you know, we roughly spend about £18 billion pounds a year on smoking-related issues. And, you know, if we heard uh, in Prime Minister's questions about mm. the importance of tax cuts. Uh, people really want tax cuts. If we are going to cut tax, we need some low-hanging fruit. And this money we're spending on smoking is completely preventable. But it will save lives as well. There's about 80,000 people a year who die from smoking. So we want the next generation to have better opportunities in life, which is a very Conservative principle. But I think Jean's point, and, and this struck me at the last Conservative Party conference, actually, because this was this big um, announcement in his conference speech when, you know, the, the leaders want the country to be saying, oh, this is what you're going to do. I mean, I agree with Jean, really. Smoking is serious, but... Is it the most serious thing? Is that the thing that you most want to tell the nation? This is my number one priority? Well, it's part of uh, the Prime Minister's kind of five-point plan. You know, we know that he wants to tackle immigration, getting inflation down, which he's achieved, growing the economy, the NHS waiting list. A lot of that is related to smoking-related illnesses. So it's part of a wider piece. It's not the only, obviously, the only thing we're doing, but it is important. And I think, you know, in years to come, people will wonder why we didn't do it years ago. Andrew Quinn, you, 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 you were whipped to vote in favour of this ban for 15 year and under to, to smoke. Is that not nanny state gone mad? Well, it's not nanny state gone mad. And look, although the Labour Party uh, did whip its MPs, it did so because this is a measure we fully support. And, you know, we were happy to support the government because the ambition of a smoke-free England is within our grasp. And, you know, I want my grandchildren to live in a world where tobacco products aren't a thing. Um, and this is the first step towards that, ensuring that any child born after 2009 is not going to be legally able to buy cigarettes whilst accepting that those born after 2009 may well already be addicted to nicotine and therefore the government's efforts, whether it's uh, Maria's government or a future Labour government, will be uh, driving down that nicotine addiction uh, and trying to wean people. What, wean what, what else will you, if you in a, in, perform the government next time, will you be banning sugar? What else will be Labour want to ban? No, I think you have to make a reason difference here in that smoking and nicotine is incredibly addictive. You don't have to have that many cigarettes to actually be hooked on nicotine. Mm -hmm. uh, that's not the same. You know, you can have a moderate drink every now and then and it doesn't damage your health. You can have a takeaway every now and then, it doesn't damage your health. I mean, obviously, if you do it all the time and that's your diet, it's going to have an impact on your health and well-being. But for most people, having the odd glass of wine, having the odd takeaway is not going to damage their health in the same way that getting hooked on nicotine would. Um, Andrew Gwynn, I think about those current smokers, the older generation, that they'll still be able yep. to, to carry on smoking. Largely working class. Yep. Some of them are your voters. Is it really fair that tax is so high? It's such a regressive tax, isn't it, given the, the, the sort of demographic of people that continue to smoke? But, look, I think what how we've got to look at this, and Maria is absolutely right, it's, it, it's a huge burden on society in how we pay for smoking-related illnesses. <coughs> and certainly smoking is the largest contributory factor to cancer still in this country. If we want to tackle the health inequalities in constituencies like mine, where smoking prevalence is still far too high, Gloria, um, then we've got to look at how we bring people off tobacco. And that means an investment in smoking cessation and public health so that people can make that yep. informed decision. Uh, Maria, 
Fiona Caulfield, <clears throat> a lot of MPs, Tory MPs on the right, think it'll fall apart because of the, of the differential in the age. That only, uh, you'd be 60 or 59 and not be able to smoke in, in a decade or so time. Jean also says, what happens to overseas visitors coming here? They're caught smoking. If they don't fall into the right age category, will they be challenged or barred from pubs? Well, you can't smoke in pubs already. That's already uh, against the law uh, for any outside, though. Uh, but it's about buying the tobacco mm. product. So it's not about the actual smoking. Mm. Uh, so it will be right. illegal for, for children, uh, you know, as they get older, to buy tobacco pro products, not just cigarettes. So it's not about the smoking itself. It's about get, getting that access. Most people start before they're, they're 21, 22. And most smokers I speak to really regret starting and would do anything to give up. So, we, you know... This is about changing cultures. And over years, um, we will see that uh, become a smoke-free generation. Yeah. Mm. Uh, we are going to go to you and we're going to change the subject. We might come back to smoking because Nikolai also had a good question on this. But Kate from Warwickshire has been in touch. And I think, Andrew Gwynn from Labour, this is really only a question for you. My question for Keir Starmer, is he going to apologise to the Labour MP Rosie Duffield in light of the cast report? Uh, you will know that this was the report conducted by an NHS paediatrician uh, which said that um, transitioning below as a child mm. is, is sort of not, not a good idea. I hope I mm. haven't paraphrased, <laughs> paraphrased that too badly. No, I, th um, I think that's a, a, a fair synopsis of it. Look, this is a very sensitive issue and I can't even begin to understand as somebody who feels very comfortable in the body that I was born into, can't even begin mm. to understand how somebody who doesn't feel comfortable uh, in the body that they were born into uh, feels and what that does to their mental um, health what that does to how they feel um, throughout life. And so this is a very serious issue that I think we have to treat uh, sensitively. But ultimately, the CAS report, we accept its findings uh, and uh, protecting children and adolescents from making a life-changing decision when they are not really of the right age to be making that decision, I think is right. I think that um, we need to reflect on what the CAS report has come out with and we absolutely have to make the changes as the government mm. is doing to ensure that children are protected. And when people decide to transition, which is a huge decision to make, it has to be at the right Beautiful. time for them to do that with the right support uh, because uh, it, it is a big, uh, big change. But yes, I would like here to meet with Rosie to discuss uh, and to consider um, Rosie's views. She's been very brave raising these issues over a long period of time. She's received a lot of flack um, mm. from all sides, but particularly from her own side. Have you met her yourself? I have met Rosie. Rosie's a, a friend of mine and uh, I've always respected her views on, on this issue. I think she um, adds to the debate and it's, it's a debate that has to have a consideration of all arguments, and Rosie's views are not wrong. Um, they are... Would you say sorry I... now on air to Rosie Duffield? Well, well, on behalf of well, you know, I personally am sorry that Rosie has been treated the way Rosie's been treated. Rosie's a friend and, you know, her views are valid. Um, as we come to de debate these very sensitive topics, you know, I want to take the toxicity out of it because, you know, it is pretty vile and these are serious issues and they don't do... They do a disservice to women and they do a disservice to... Um, trans people mm. and I think we need to approach this much more sensitively. Credit where credit's due. The Labour Party seems to have moved a long way from being unable to answer whether women can have penises. Yeah, Get, getting that right. <laughs> yes, haven't they? Well, yeah, but, I mean, the government uh, was, you know, pretty um, instrumental in a lot of these changes. We've already banned, you know, uh, uh, puberty blockers for children. This is about mm. children uh, yeah. rather than adults who want to take decisions. We've closed down the Tavistock and opening up uh, two new centres <coughs> across the country for children who have got uh, gender uh, dysphoria but not go down the route of uh, same-sex hormones or puberty blockers. And we were criticised quite heavily at the time for doing that. Um, the CAS review has vindicated our actions and there's still more work to, to do to make sure they're safe cards are in place to make sure that this never happens again. But people like Rosie, it's a wide discussion, people like Rosie who raise concerns about quite contentious issues 
We need to learn to hear those yes. views without it turning into a really toxic debate. So I think there's lessons across the board, yeah. but on I this agree. particular issue, the, the government okay. has been pretty robust in its response. Everyone agrees, there we go. Across the consensus yeah. there and um, on the issue of, uh, so. of, 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 of transitioning, yeah, some... which is even, even yes. a bigger... Yeah, and rightly bigger. so, there are children here going through a lot and perhaps it's not really a political debate all the time. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Barry's message in, Maria Caulfield, can somebody please ask the PM when you're going to stop pandering to the woke and ban <laughs> illegal migration? On the day, of course, you'll be in the Parliament later trying to overturn the laws amendments to the Randa Bill. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, and, you know, getting down uh, illegal immigration is a key priority. We're already um, seeing about 25,000 people a, a year being uh, returned. The Rwanda bill is not just about getting planes off the ground as a deterrent for people who enter here illegally. There's uh, powers to disapply the Human Rights Act for those constant challenges to deportation. There's uh, powers for ministers to overrule some of the European Court judge, uh, judgments, which enable uh, yeah. uh, deportations to be stopped. So it's more than about getting planes off the ground. Andrew Green, just, just back it. Should yeah. Labour just back it? It might work. Anything's if it worth works. a go. But, you're, but the Labour Party position yeah. is, even if it does work, we're still scrapping it. It doesn't sit right, does it? But look, Gloria, we have to look at this in the round. Is it a good use of public money for it to cost £2 million per person to send them to Rwanda? I don't think it is. I don't think any sane-minded person would think it is worth £2 million per person. And then that's just the cost of getting them to Rwanda. The cost of housing them here, at the moment, um, a lot of money is spent on hotel costs and the government... I think is right to want to uh, remove those hotel costs altogether. But it's also more barges? What well, do you well, its main answer is to do up two RAF bases. They, um, they scheduled £5 million per base. It turns <coughs> out that one base is going to cost £49 million to, to do up and the other base £27 million. That cost is far more than the cost of putting them in hotels. In fact, you could put all <laughs> those... Um, illegal uh, immigrants on a, a cruise liner and send them round the, the world in perpetuity at a, a lesser cost than this government's paying. We've got to tackle the issue at source. That means cracking the gangs. It means working with do our European partners. you think they crack the gangs? I mean, seriously. Yeah. It's a, it's a, it's we a need great to do, line, we but need of course to, We need to do a lot to more across Europe because the point is, if people get across the med, the channel's a cinch. So why aren't we helping our European partners stopping these people coming across the med? Because once they get to Europe, the channel's nothing if you've crossed the Mediterranean. Iranian. Yes, well, Maria, would you agree with that? I mean, it's well, interesting. I think, you know, we've heard that uh, Keir Starmer has been over to Europe uh, to start negotiations about qu taking quotas of people in order to cooperate uh, uh, with uh, EU countries. That's not something we would support. We absolutely are tackling the backlog. There's huge progress yeah. made towards the end of the last, but it's your uh, last year. But, but it's, it's being tackled and people are being deported. It's not being tackled, the it's your backlog. Entries are being, people are being turned away as well. Uh, and the final kind of piece, jig, piece of the jigsaw is the Rwanda... Uh, flights which are a deterrent, uh, but which also will try and stop those constant legal challenges, both disciplining the Human Rights Act and uh, giving ministers powers to overrule some of those emergency European court decisions, which take people literally off flights as they're be being deported. So the Rwanda bill is about much more than sending people to Rwanda. Moving on quickly, Andrew Gwynne. Uh, Bev Turner mentioned smacking earlier in her handover to this programme. She's now she's been reborn as Christina. <laughs> well, Christina, go on, Judge. Christina, do you say where you're from when you do send these brilliant messages in and questions. She says that parents should be allowed to discipline their own children with a smack if they judge it correct at the right time. If a child runs out of the road, for example, or doesn't listen to a parent, what do you think? Smacking. Look, as a parent and a grandparent, I have been in the fortunate position that I have never, ever smacked my children. Uh, I don't like violence towards anybody. Chris, if I smacked you right now, you'd be justified to smack me back. Uh, but... oh, I deserve it, Andrew. <laughs> but, but, but They're I'm very bit... jealous but, over their ties. I mean, bit... wearing the same ties, they're about, about but, to have fisticuffs. Well, I'm a bit miffed that you tweeted who wears it best. <laughs> okay, anyway, on a anyway. serious point, smacking but, children. But smacking children, look, if I smacked you, I'd be charged with assault. I don't think it's right to smack children. Any but parent dis but, but discipline them, certainly. Mm. I've managed to discipline all three of my children and my grandchild uh, without ever 
ever resorting to physical violence. OK, Maria, Maria look, I don't think the government, certainly a Conservative government, is not in the, uh, the, the place to be telling parents how to bring up their children. Um, you know, we've had a nanny state uh, debate around smoking, and for me, the benefits of, of uh, uh, having a smoke-free generation outweigh any of the, the concerns. But I think telling uh, parents how to bring up their children is just a step too far for the state. Mm. Mm. Interesting. We're now going to move into your briefs. Health Minister, want to be Health Minister? It's the big question. OK. NHS and A&E waiting lists are too long, so what's the plan to cut down on those waiting lists? And the question here is from, from Mary. Mary. So who's going first? You're first. Oh, right. right. Well, I'm first. Well, uh, as, as is always the case with this government, they'll probably pinch my idea once, once I say it. But look, we are committed to really tackling on NHS waiting lists, getting those waiting lists back down. And what we're saying is extra investment in... Um, more uh, operations, more appointments, and we do that, yes, by clamping down on tax evasion and particularly, Chris, uh, in tightening up the non-DOM rules because whilst the government might have pinched our idea, <laughs> it is riddled with holes and we would do it properly and get the money in to fund the NHS. The NHS is always better under a Labour government. Maria Caulfield, well, we only, run, we only run the A&E departments in England um, and we have seen a, a fall in uh, waiting times, both our four-hour and 12-hour waits. That's this winter and we did that by opening up 5,000 extra beds, 10,000 uh, extra virtual beds in the community and our waiting times are 40% lower than in Wales, where Labour run the health Do you think it's there. fine in England? Do you think the No, the, the, but it's the, significantly the better uh, in, uh, than compared to Wales. But if you see what we did this winter, the, in March we had the busiest ever month for A&E attendances, and despite that, our four-hour waits, our 12-hour waits... compare it with the NHS improved. in England under the last Labour government. Well, lowest waiting times, lowest but waiting lists... you didn't list, have a global highest, pandemic highest, which highest, shut down the health service... No, we had a global financial years. crash. Highest patient satisfaction. That's Labour's I'm, record I'm, on I'm the NHS. Worked in the NHS under a Labour government and never And it was again. much better than it, it is now. It absolutely was not. It's time to say thank you. <laughs> <laughs> You've been fiery. There's been consensus when it's been most important, I would say. Yeah. Um, it's been a pleasure to have you both. Maria Caulfield, Health Minister, and Shadow Health Minister, Andrew Gwynn. Coming up, Good Afternoon Britain, with Tom and Emily who are going to be... There they are! Have you Here missed we are. us? Have you missed the handover? <laughs> we love this bit. It's the favourite part of the show because it's completely unscripted. We could say literally anything, Gloria. Um, but Please no, don't. Got... <laughs> but we have got a huge show coming up. We're going to be back in Brussels because the second day of this NatCon conference, after it was tried to be shut down by the police and by the local mayors, well, it's back on after a court injunction. It is back on. We'll find out what exactly happened. But have you seen also... What what on earth is going on in Dubai? Now, up to a million Brits travelled to Dubai, or at least last year they mm. did. Lots of people caught up in that. We're going to be speaking to one man because the floods, biblical floods, have in the come desert. to Dubai. Floods in the desert. Well, but is this self-inflicted? We're going to be talking to an expert on these artificial clouds that have been made by the government of Dubai. It's really interesting crazy. stuff. Uh, not just that, though, also squatting. A couple of restaurants have been taken over in London now. We'll be asking, should that be made a criminal offence? Thank you, Tom, mm. and thank you, Emily. What a thrilling show coming ahead. That's all from me and Gloria. Yeah, we will be back next week. You've been watching and listening to PMQ's Live with Christopher Hope and Gloria De Piera. Don't go anywhere, because the fabulous Tom and Emily are coming up next. A brighter outlook with Bob Solar. Sponsors of Weather on GB News. Hello, welcome to your latest weather update from the Met Office for GB News. Most places having a fine bright day out there. It's on the chilly side. There are some showers, particularly in the east, and we have this weather system just trickling south that's bringing some rain to parts of Northern Ireland. So staying fairly grey and damp here and across the eastern parts of England especially, it is still gusty with a cold wind blowing and a fair few showers drifting in. One or two scattered showers for uh, Wales and Northern Scotland, but many places will just be dry and bright with some decent spells of sunshine but the breeze is still coming down from the north not as strong as recent days but it, it's 